Hello, I'm Carol Fleck, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation titled, Why is Time So Slippery? Understanding Time Blindness in People with ADHD. Whether it's getting to work on time, meeting deadlines, or prioritizing tasks, it's safe to say that most things in life involve time management. It's a critical skill, but it's a hard one to master for people with ADHD. Core symptoms like weak executive function skills make the concept of time a complicated one. Most individuals with ADHD don't have an internal clock, that gut feeling that helps you judge how long a task or project might take, so they don't feel that internal pressure to ramp up and meet a deadline until it's often too late. Fortunately, there are techniques to learn how to manage time, how to see it, and how to feel it. In today's webinar, we'll discuss how ADHD impacts seeing time clearly, including concepts such as temporal discounting and time horizon. We'll introduce strategies to increase motivation, track deadlines, and curb the consequences of time blindness. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Ari Tuckman. Dr. Tuckman is a psychologist and sex therapist in private practice in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He is a former board member of CHAD National and co-chair of the CHAD Conference Committee. He's the author of four books, including ADHD After Dark, Better Sex Life, Better Relationship, and Understand Your Brain, Get More Done. He also has a podcast called More Attention, Less Deficit. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Tuckman, I have just a few housekeeping items. For those of you tuned in to the live webinar, you may submit questions for the expert at any time by navigating to the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, Look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 424 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. In the latest fall issue, experts offer practical advice on how adults can conquer social anxiety, what ADHD symptoms look like in older adults, and why some people quit taking their ADHD meds. We're working on our winter issue now, and it's full of great advice on how to get through the holidays and enjoy them with family and friends who might not understand ADHD or other co-occurring conditions. Sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Click the link on screen to download now on the App Store and Google Play Store. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Ari Tuckman. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion. All right, it is great to be here. Um, I don't normally present wearing my jacket inside, but um, the heater is broken in my office and it is a refreshing 62 degrees in here. So um, so that's what we're doing. It'll uh, keep me awake, so no problem. Uh, so let's talk about time. Let's talk about how ADHD impacts time. And, you know, as I've been I've been working with ADHD for like 25 years now, and I've had this sort of evolution in how I think about what is ADHD, what kind of makes ADHD ADHD. And, you know, initially when I first started out, I just sort of remembered all the symptoms. Like, I don't know why they are, but they are, so just remember that. 
then at a certain point, um, you know, I came across Barclay's work and some other folks' work, um, Tom Brown, looking at executive functions. And then I was like, oh, that's why. That's it's because ADHD affects the executive functions. And that's why you get all these kind of symptoms and struggles and challenges associated with ADHD, but then not other things, right? So folks with ADHD know what to do. They understand social stuff, let's say, but they have a hard time maybe acting on those, you know, acting on that knowledge in the moment, right? So that became kind of my second understanding of ADHD. Now we're going to talk about how ADHD impacts time. And this is like my third, this is my current understanding of really understanding kind of what it is that makes ADHD ADHD. So how does ADHD affect time and how does that then impact the executive functions? So that's what we're talking about here today. And so just in general, just kind of starting out, um, you know, time management involves the ability to sort of plan and then complete tasks in relation to time. So there's a few things kind of going on there. Um, but to do that, to actually make a plan and then carry it out effectively involves kind of two related abilities. And we're going to talk about them kind of each of them at length here. One of them is the ability to see time. And I'll talk about what that means. But it's also the ability to kind of feel the future, right? So here I am sitting in this present moment. How do I feel what's going to happen later? And in other words, have the motivation to actually do something, right? So you got to be aware of what it is that perhaps you should be doing, but then you also have to be motivated to actually act upon it. So um, I have a line I use a lot, which is that ADHD doesn't invent new struggles. It just exacerbates the universal ones, right? So all people have some struggles with time. Some people have many more struggles and people who have ADHD tend to have more of these specific kinds of struggles. So not different in kind, just different in degree. Um, so <clears throat> in order to manage time well, it really begins, as so many other things do, it begins with managing attention well, right? Or another way of putting it is, Time management requires attention management. So this kind of happens in a couple ways, or this goes off the rails in a couple ways. Maybe that's the better way to put it. So, you know, on the one hand, anytime we get distracted, right, when our attention shifts, when it should have stuck, um, whatever that great plan was, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Um, it kind of goes out the window, right? Like, whatever those good intentions were, they sort of fall by the wayside because your attention kind of shifts away to some other thing that grabs you. Now, on the flip side of that, you know, as people with ADHD know very well, um, it's not just about distractibility. There's also the hyper-focus associated with ADHD, right? So that hyper-focus, it kind of looks like awesome attention, but really what it is, is too much sticking when you should have shifted, right? That it's getting so focused on the task at hand that you lose track of the passage of time, right? So in some ways, hyper-focus is, it's about time. It's about losing awareness of time. How long have I been doing this? What else do I need to do? When should I shift? What else needs to happen here, right? So it's kind of a lo losing a attention and awareness of the bigger picture. Um, and at any given moment, ideally, we're sort of monitoring and we're sort of making a decision, a moment by moment decision of do I stick with what I'm doing or do I shift my attention to something else, right? So good attention regulation is dynamic. It's a constant process moment by moment. Again, we all have our moments where things don't work out. Folks with ADHD have more of those moments. Ultimately, time management is not about this moment. Time management is about the future. It's about doing something now that's going to probably be better at some later point in time. So some tasks, you don't really particularly have to manage time, right? You get a text, when are you coming home? I'll be home at 6, send, right? 1.4 seconds, 
<clears throat> no time to manage. You just, it's done. But unfortunately, most things in life, and certainly anything meaningful and worthwhile, isn't done in 1.4 seconds, right? It takes a whole lot more time. It takes the ability to sort of resist distractions and prioritize and think about not just this moment and what's going to be the best or the most interesting or the most important right now, but what's going to be better and more important for me or the people I care about at some later point in time. So we manage time in this moment, in the present moment, so that we're going to be happier with how things work out at some later moment. Um, so this then brings us to um, Russell Barclay's response inhibition theory of ADHD. So response inhibition, meaning inhibiting, meaning stopping a response, right? So it's that ability to be, get hit with a stimulus and pause, hold back the response, and think about the bigger picture. Should I grab, okay, I just got a text. Do I grab my phone? Do I look at it? Do I keep doing what I'm doing now? Or, you know, you're walking through the kitchen, you're getting ready, dog knocks something over, pause, stop. Do I deal with that? Do I keep going with what I'm doing, right? Like we're constantly hit with all these kind of things that come at us from the world around us. We're also hit with thoughts that come at us from within our own mind, right? Like, oh, here's an interesting idea. Or, oh, I was going to look that up. Or, oh, yeah, I was going to do that other thing, right? So we have all this information that comes at our attention at any given moment. And we're always trying to sort of sort through and decide. Because mostly, you can really only kind of do one thing at a time. So what is the thing that I should be doing now? What should I be paying attention to? What should I be putting my energy into? So in order to think about that future goal, in order to put some energy towards that thing that's more about the future, we need to be able to stop and pause and say, nope, not reacting to that. Or as Alan Brown, the awesome Alan Brown says, this is not what I'm doing right now, right? So that ability to say, nope, that's not the thing I'm paying attention to. Let me reflect on what I should be paying attention to instead. So this then brings us to our first of two big concepts. So big concept number one is something called time horizon. So if you think about the, you know, like physical horizon. So let's say you're standing on the beach, you're looking out across the ocean and there's a ship out there and it's coming towards you. So depending upon a bunch of factors, at a certain point, yep, there it is. I, yep, there's a little dot. I see a ship out there, right? At a certain point, you will be able to see that ship. Now, how close it needs to be before you see it depends on, I don't know, how good are you, is your vision, obviously, how big and bright is the ship, um, what are the conditions? Is it nighttime, daytime, raining, foggy, right? So a lot of stuff is going to determine how close or far that ship can be before it, it sort of hits your vision, let's say. Now, by analogy, there's also a horizon of time, meaning here I am on Tuesday. Am I thinking about tomorrow, Wednesday? Am I thinking about this weekend? What about the end of the year? What about like retirement? Am I thinking about that, right? How close in time does something need to be before it hits my awareness where I'm like, oh, I should probably do something about that. So I don't know, here's a thing. Um, six weeks from now is the big ADHD conference in Dallas. Just bought my airline tickets, right? I don't need them now. I don't need them tomorrow. But six weeks from now, I'm going to be really happy I bought the tickets and I don't wind up on a, you know, 3 a.m. flight or something. So, you know, in general, then, um, the closer in time something is, the easier it is to pay attention to. The, hard, the farther out in time, perhaps, the harder it is to notice it for it to sort of hit your mental radar. Young kids tend to have very short time horizons. That's why they have adults who remind them to brush their teeth and to go to bed and to eat some vegetables and do their homework and all that stuff. 
So um, the impact of ADHD on this then kind of brings us to probably a phrase many people here know, which is this idea of what's called time blindness. And again, I keep calling back to Barkley, but he's kind of the man, so it's hard not to. Um, you know, he, he says that ADHD causes future myopia, meaning that folks with ADHD don't see the future as clearly. They're, they see very clearly right now, but thinking about, you know, three days from now, a week, a month, right, depending on age, right, they don't see as far into the future often. And, you know, it sort of leads to this idea that for folks with ADHD, there are kind of like two times. And obviously, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, except it's not completely right. So there's now, meaning obviously, whatever is happening like right now, whatever needs to be worked on, whatever needs to be done, whatever is interesting. And then there's not now and pretty much everything that isn't now gets chucked into the not now bucket. So that could be tomorrow. It could be 30 years from now. It all gets put into the not now, not thinking about it, not dealing with it. Um, so in general, then, because folks with ADHD tend to have a shorter time horizon, um, they tend to not plan as far out into the future. So when you've got that big deadline on Friday and it's Thursday night, now you feel it. But when it's Monday afternoon and like, I don't know, might be a reasonable, like, you know, life would be easier on Thursday if you did a few things now, it's kind of not on your radar as much. So this is why folks with ADHD procrastinate so much. It's because they're not looking as far into the future. They're not thinking as far ahead for what needs to happen later until all of a sudden the later becomes the now. Here we are. It has gone from not now to now. Now I've got that deadline. Now I need to start working on it. Which then brings us to our second big concept. And this is something called temporal discounting. And this is a term from economics. And basically the de what it means is so temporal meaning time and discounting meaning something becomes less valuable. So if I said, hey, here's a hundred bucks right now, here's a hundred bucks cash in hand, you'd feel pretty psyched about that. By contrast, if I said, here's a hundred bucks, but I'm going to put it over here in a month from now, I'm going to give you that hundred bucks. Are you exactly as excited about a hundred bucks a month from now? You're not, right? It doesn't feel, even though it's exactly the same math, right? It's exactly the same amount of cash. We don't feel it the same kind of a way. Um, or to put it, so that's a reward. Well, give an example of a punishment. Um, when it's midnight and you just finished one episode of something on Netflix, and you're like, oh man, this is such a good show. I should totally watch the next episode. The fun of that episode feels pretty big. The I'm going to feel like crap tomorrow because I didn't get enough sleep feels pretty small until it's tomorrow. And then you're like, oh, why did I do that? Right? So in general, everybody we feel the present more than we feel the future. And things like saving for retirement in 40 years, we really don't feel that. Um, folks with ADHD really, really feel the present much more so than the future, right? This is, if anyone took Psych 101, this is the marshmallow experiment. Um, that getting one marshmallow right now for some little kids feels much better than getting two marshmallows a few minutes from now. Obviously, marshmallows are not a big deal, but things like studying for tests, um, going to school rather than working so you can earn more money later, eating vegetables so that you know you don't die of a heart attack at 50, um, exercising, all the sort of boring stuff of adult responsibility is all about the future. It's about sacrificing in the present so that you're better off later. So when you put these two together, it explains a lot about why folks with ADHD make some of the choices that they do and have the struggles that they do. So folks with ADHD have a shorter time horizon, right? They don't see necessarily as far into the future. It's not part of their mental planning. 
Um, as a result, they have more temporal discounting, right? They feel the pain of the moment or the pleasure of the moment more than they feel the pain or the pleasure of the future. As a result, folks with ADHD tend to choose the options or be activated by, be drawn to the activities that have more immediate payoffs, right? The thing that's going to be more desirable or less undesirable right now weighs more heavily um, because they really feel the present more strongly than the future. It's harder to make yourself do the stuff in the moment that's going to involve more, more displeasure now, but more, you know, good stuff later until all of a sudden the future becomes the present. And of course, at that point, you can't turn back the clock and say, "Ugh, I wish I'd done more of this earlier. Which leads us to, you know, Barclay's famous quote, ADHD is not a disorder of knowing what to do. It's a disorder of doing what you know. Every client I see, they all know what to do. Knowing what to do is the easy part. The hard part is making ourselves do the stuff that we don't feel like doing. And, you know, the sort of example I give here for the non-ADHD folks is it's kind of like losing weight, right? Losing weight is actually incredibly simple in terms of what you need to know, right? You just eat less and exercise more. That's pretty much it, right? That is the gist. I mean, eat healthy food, whatever, but pretty much it's really easy on the knowing. It's really hard to do it because you do it not only once, you don't eat kale one time to lose weight, right? You eat a lot of kale and you go to the gym a lot of times, even when you don't feel like it. So that's the difference between knowing and doing. Um, so one of the ways then, if we're going to kind of take this time perspective on ADHD, you know, one of the ways of thinking about ADHD then is ADHD is too much present and not enough future, right? The folks with ADHD very much feel and see the present moment. The challenge is to disengage, to sort of put that pause and say, nope, that's not what I'm doing now. Nope, that's not what I'm supposed to pay attention to right now. And to see beyond it and to think about like, what else? What else down, what's coming down the, down the road? What's further out in the time horizon? Let me think about what else I need to do, what else I could do, right? That is a much harder thing for all people, especially for people who have ADHD. So let's then, talk about what do we do about it, right? Because that's really kind of why we're here. The theory is interesting and all, but like, what do you do about it? So let's talk about two sets of strategies, right? One set here is going to be how to see time more effectively and to see it by externalizing it, right? Don't sort of keep it in your head, create tools and systems and other stuff to make time more visible out there, right? So we're going to try to stretch that time horizon so that it's less driven by the moment and a bit more looking farther down the road. So, you know, coming back to where we started, that good time management begins with good attention management, is let's put some energy into managing your attention and what pulls at it. Let's put some energy into reducing some of the temptations because, I don't know, Willpower never works as well as we wish it to. If you over rely on willpower, it will tend to fail you. That's just kind of like a sad fact of human nature. So, um, you know, a lot of these good ADHD management strategies are about this, right? They're about kind of eliminating distractions and temptations on the outside rather than relying on willpower on the inside to say, nope, 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 not doing that. Right. Kind of the same deal. Right. If you're trying to eat healthier, having less garbage in the, you know, in the pantry, less junk food in the pantry makes it a whole lot more likely that you're going to eat healthier stuff rather than junky stuff. Um, and I often kind of think about this idea of kind of signal to noise ratio. Right. This is I think it's a term from radio back in the day. Um, so signal meaning that's the thing I want to hear and pay attention to. 
versus noise is all the distractions and the junk and the other stuff that sort of pulls at our attention at every moment. So we can make the signal stronger, let's say setting an alarm that goes off, oh, it's that time now, or you can make the distractions, make the noise softer, right? And either way, you can work it, work it on both sides, right? A lot of ADHD strategies is making the right stuff stand out a bit more and making the other stuff kind of stand out a bit less. Um, <clears throat> So I often talk to clients about, while well, either just actually using a schedule um, or how they use it. And, you know, in general, um, you don't have to have a schedule. Like, you don't actually. But, you know, if you can remember everything inside your head that you have going on in your life, probably you don't have enough going on in your life. I mean, I don't know, at least for me, right? Each of their own. But like, seriously, you want a life that's bigger, more interesting, more complicated than your ability to remember it inside your own mind. So, um, so to use a schedule system, whatever one it is, Google Calendar, something written, some crazy productivity app, like whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Just in general, use it. Use it often enough. Use it most of the time. It doesn't need to be perfect, but every time you use it is a little bit better than a time that you don't. Now, the challenge for a lot of folks with ADHD is that often um, schedules are things that have that feel like they've been sort of you know, foisted upon them, right? Like teachers and parents and maybe spouses or bosses have sort of crammed the schedule onto them and said, you got to use this. And like, nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be forced to do something somebody else's way. So it usually doesn't work. But, you know, the thing about having a schedule is it's not about other people's, I don't know, neurotic anxiety or trying to control you or whatever. Using a schedule is about it helps you get done more of what you want to do. It helps you get done what is important to you. So that's a whole lot more motivating to maybe put in the effort to use this uh, schedule. Um, you know, some clients that I've seen have sort of like they're hesitant to put stuff in their schedule because it's sort of like, well, Thursday at four, I don't know if I want to do that thing. What if I want to do something else on Thursday at four, right? So they kind of like to leave their options open. And that's totally fine. I get it. Um, but just because you put it in your schedule doesn't make it a blood oath, right? It's not a tattoo. You didn't, you know, sign up for the French Foreign Legion or anything, right? Like, put it in there. Do your best. If the stars don't align, you could always move it. But at least if it's there, you got a place to start. The other thing that I'll often recommend is don't just put a thing into the schedule, but kind of add in a bunch of extra stuff. So things like, like, here's an example. Um, I have a young guy that I see a client who put into his schedule that he had a doctor's appointment, let's say Friday at 10. Awesome, right? He needs you guys mid refill, perfect. But that's all he put, doctor's appointment Friday at 10. What he didn't put is which office, because the doctor has, I guess, a couple offices. So he throws it into Google Maps, jumps in the car, races over, wrong office. By the time he could get to the right office, he missed his appointment. So not only the time, but maybe also the address, maybe a phone number, maybe bring forms, maybe whatever, right? Put that extra stuff in there. Don't have to hold it here. It's there in the schedule. Also makes the schedule more likely, which then makes you more likely to keep using the schedule, right? So there is indeed a momentum to this. Um, another sort of big point of advice that I give is this idea of putting to-do list items into your schedule. And, you know, the problem with to-do lists is that stuff that gets put on a to-do list tends to just sort of sit there forever, right? It's sort of like to-do lists become graveyards of failed aspirations. And the reason is when you look at your to-do list, you know, it's sort of like, um, Hmm. Is now the time to do this? Maybe, or or it could be the 
time to do this, or I could do this, or flip, flip, flip. Actually, maybe, man, this thing's been on here forever. Maybe this is the thing, right? It's like, we don't know what to do when, right? So that's the problem with to-do lists. Like, there's definitely a place in the world for them, don't get me wrong. But I think it's sometimes helpful to take time, take stuff off of the to-do list and make it time specific, meaning, okay, this thing I'm going to do at this time, this thing I'm going to do at that time, right? Taking it and literally like plugging it into your schedule. This is especially helpful if there are things that have time constraints. So like, I got to call this person during business hours or on Monday afternoon or something. Um, now, obviously other things will come up. And again, no blood oats here, right? If you schedule that I'm going to do this on Thursday afternoon, some other thing comes up, just move it, like whatever, just scribble it off and move it over. If you're doing electronically, it's even easier to move it around. Um, but one of the sort of side benefits of putting to-do lists into your to-do list items into your schedule is um, for the folks who tend to take on too much because they kind of forget everything that they have going on, like as you begin to plug stuff into your schedule, you see like, oh, Actually, I don't have time on Thursday to meet with you. I thought I did, like in theory I do, except for like all these other things. So actually I can't do Thursday. What does next week look like? Um, so the thing about putting stuff into your schedule is it doesn't guarantee it gets done. It doesn't make you do it. But what it does do is at least it makes you aware. And awareness is a big part, right? Awareness counts for a lot, I think. Because um, if you're not aware of it, if it falls off your radar, then you're done, game over. If you're aware of it, at least now you got a shot at doing it, which kind of then brings us to the next part here, which is how to increase the motivation to actually do the stuff that you're aware of, that you're aware that you probably should do. So, you know, as I say here, maximize motivation by feeling the future, right? So we're kind of coming back to our second big concept of temporal discounting, right? Feeling the future more fully in that moment. Um, so the problem with life then is we have all these different things at any given moment that we could be doing. Right. Some of them are maybe work or school related. Some of them are about personal life. Some of them are about relationships. Some of them are about, I don't know, just taking care of stuff. Right. So there's all sorts of different stuff we could be doing. There's all sorts of stuff we could be paying attention to. Um, what do we do? Right. How do we make a decision in this moment about how best to use this time? Um, and, you know, in general, I'm a big proponent of natural consequences in the sense of like, you know, if your kid tends to leave their towel on the floor, awesome, because a wet, gross, cold towel is a pretty good motivator, you know, to hang up your towel today so you don't have a gross towel tomorrow. It's also pretty cool because nobody ever dies of wet, gross towels, so it's an easy thing to be like, ah, eh, she'll learn. Um, the problem with natural consequences, though, is there are too many things in life where they don't work. And, you know, any parent of a kid with ADHD has almost certainly gotten some advice of, you just need to let him fail, then he'll figure it out, which is only true when it's true, right? It's not true, unfortunately, for too many things. So, you know, for a lot of stuff, by the time the natural consequences kick in, it's kind of too late. So, you know, if you don't hand in your tax returns, right, it's kind of like it ain't a problem until it's a problem, right? It's not a problem until you want to like, I don't know, refinance your mortgage or, you know, do some other sort of big financial transaction where you actually need a tax return. Um, you know, if you tend to eat a bunch of junky stuff, it's fine now, although you might feel a bit barfy afterwards, but like really the problem with unhealthy eating isn't today, it's like 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. Um, and in terms of doing daily homework, right, as the parent of any kid with ADHD knows, right, 
it's a problem at the end of the marking period. When 15 assignments need to be done in the last two days of the marking period, now it's a problem, right? But eight weeks ago, when it would have been good to have gotten that homework done, didn't feel it, right? Like the pressure wasn't there because of the temporal discounting. It wasn't a problem until it's actually a problem. And if you really want to talk about natural consequences for not doing homework, the true natural consequence of not doing homework is in the fall after, it's in September after you graduate high school, where instead of going to this college campus, you're going to that college campus, maybe, right? Like that is actually when real natural consequences begin to kick in if you're not doing your homework as a, as a middle school or a high school kid. So natural consequences, again, they're great. I love them when they work, but often they don't work. So this leads me to kind of my unofficial slogan of ADHD time management, which is by the time you feel it, it's too late. When it's Thursday night and you procrastinated on that thing you need to do for work on Friday, it's too late. Right? You can't rewind the clock and say, oh, I should really start this on Tuesday or Wednesday. Or when it's you know the 30th of the month and you didn't really save all those receipts that you need to submit you know, so you could get reimbursed for them. It's kind of too late to go back and try to figure out like, uh, wait a second, how many miles did I drive? Where did I take clients for lunch or whatever? Or, you know, when it's three hours before companies arriving and you haven't done all the prep, right? It's too late to kind of go back to yesterday and start getting ready for the company who's coming in three hours. So, it becomes this kind of painful lesson again and again and again. And, you know, as we said before, ADHD is not a disorder of knowing what to do. If you give them the hypothetical, they know it. They know it very well. Experience has taught them very well what's going to happen. The trick is doing it, doing the right thing in the heat of the moment. So, this then brings us to five, I've got three here and two on the next slide, five ways to kind of what I call bringing the future into the present, right? So to feel the future now in this moment and not waiting until it becomes too late. So, you know, one of them is to make the consequences much more immediate. So in general, a really good bit of advice for motivating, especially people with ADHD, but frankly anybody, is making the is to shorten the space between action and consequence. So, you know, for a teenager, for example, right, they can't play video games until today, tonight, until they get their homework done. We're not waiting eight weeks for the end of the quarter to now do 15 homework assignments. Right now, today you cannot play video games until your homework is done. We're not arguing, we're not fighting, we're not debating, like it's done or it's not. And if it ain't done, you're not playing anything. You're not getting your other screens. Perhaps make the consequences much more frequent. So for example, um, you know, if somebody works in a job where they have, you know, good news is a fair bit of leeway about what they do and when and how, bad news is they still got to get stuff done. Um, I don't know, maybe do more frequent check-ins with their boss or maybe a college student checking in with a professor or whatever, right? Where let's just do let's five, 10 minute check-in. Let's just kind of see where I'm at. I'll just kind of let you know what I'm doing. You can ask any questions. It'll just kind of help me like stay on track and make sure I'm getting stuff done, right? So you don't wait two weeks to hand in the big thing. You do, you know, maybe every day or two, you do a quick check-in. <clears throat> um maybe make the consequences more external. So, um, you know, might be, so rather than just feeling bad on the inside or worrying on the inside and hoping it works out, actually make it a bit more external. So for example, if you know you tend to run late, like telling a friend if you're gonna meet them for dinner, um, look, if I'm late, if I'm more than 10 minutes late, I'll buy you dinner, right? Totally artificial consequence, right? Making it up. Or um, I have a client of mine who, was having trouble getting out of bed. She set up this bet with her boyfriend, you know, that whoever like jumped out of bed and turned on the light, you know, at, by the end of the month or whatever, um, you know, like 
she would have to paint her fingernails the color of an opposing football team, for example, if she lost. So um, that was a pretty good motivator for her, and it made it kind of fun and whatever to do this kind of silly bet. So whatever it is that you can find a way, something that's going to hook you, something that's going to motivate you and kind of push you forward. Um, two more ways to feel the future more in the present. Um, you know, one of them might be to make the consequences much more salient, meaning kind of more attention grabbing. So if you've got a teenager who you're really kind of struggling to get out of bed, struggling to get out the door, there's always like a mad dash to get to the bus. Um, you know, I don't know if they miss the bus and you got to be their Uber. I don't know. They're paying you five bucks or 10 bucks or something. Right. So the I feel guilty about messing up mom or dad's morning may not be that big a motivator, but here's 10 bucks. Maybe that is right. Maybe they're like, OK, that I can feel or they got to pay you with their cell phone of like, here's my cell phone. I'll get it back when I get home tonight. Something that's going to mean something to them. And then finally, sometimes you need to make those artificial consequences more consistent because the problem with natural consequences is sometimes you get away with it, right? Sometimes it actually works out. So we're like, ooh, I'm feeling lucky. Maybe this is one of those times where the teacher doesn't check our homework. Or maybe my boss won't call on me to talk about this thing in the big meeting tomorrow, right? So making it much more consistent. So, you know, things like Weight Watchers with all the points and stuff, or, you know, these various kind of like diet or food tracking apps, whatever, right? Like if you enter it in immediately, every single time, there's no fudging the numbers. There's no wishful thinking of like, I think I ate some vegetables today. I can probably have a couple of cookies, right? So being really consistent so there's no room to wiggle, so to speak. So just in general, right, imposing artificial consequences tends to be more effective than waiting for natural consequences to show up and kick in. Now, in general, then, um, obviously, we can't always sort of jerry-rig the system, right, in terms of the stuff I just shared on the last couple of slides. Sometimes it's got to be a bit more of a kind of inside job that just sort of within our mind, we got to think about it and figure out what to do. So, you know, one of the ways then to compensate for temporal discounting, right, that tendency to really feel the present and to sort of ignore the future um, is to be intentional about kind of pausing and picturing, right? So, if here I am on, you know, Tuesday and I got this big thing on Friday, right? Let me really, really think about Friday. If I work on this now, if I put a bit of effort in, how does Thursday night and Friday work out? How do I feel walking to that big meeting, right? Let me really kind of think about that. Compare and contrast, if I don't do anything now or tomorrow or Thursday during the day and I wait till Thursday night, then how do I feel on Thursday night? How do I feel about on Friday? Like, what is the sort of like the doubt, the uncertainty, the angst, the frustration of like, oh, here we go again. And then, you know, can't spend time with my wife and kid and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I don't get enough sleep. And then Friday kind of sucks. And then Friday night's not as good. So let's, right, like, let's really kind of think about what that feels like. Um, or, Another way of sort of thinking about it or of sort of explaining it to someone is how's future you going to feel about present you, right? So is Thursday night you going to look back and say, God, Tuesday me, I hate that guy. That guy sucks. He's always screwing me. Tuesday me is the worst, right? Thursday me, I'm the one who's paying the price. If Tuesday me would actually carry their weight, this would be a whole different ball game right now, right? So you can kind of play it up a bit. But it's true, right? Because it's the me of Thursday that will reap the reward or pay the consequence for what I did on Tuesday. Um, so the more you can bring that future into how you feel in the present moment, the more likely you're going to be motivated to actually think about the future and do something about it. And, you know, I kind of will sort of emphasize this idea that 
often people ask themselves the wrong question. So this is the wrong question. Um, do I feel like doing this now? No, no, you don't. The answer is always no. By the way, on Thursday, the answer is still no, still don't want to do this thing. The problem is now on Thursday, I don't have any choice, right? I got to do it even though I hate it. Also, by the way, FYI, probably hate it more on Thursday because now you have the misery of the stress of the last minute. You have the misery of having to stay up late and kind of like, you know, beating yourself up about the fact you didn't do it. So do I want to do this now is the wrong question. The better question is, how will Thursday me feel about Tuesday me based on what I do or don't do now? That is a much better question. So um, so let's, let's go to the Q&A. Let me just do one more quick slide. But my hope is that this has sort of made sense, right? That it's helped you sort of understand this relation between ADHD and time and why time feels so kind of slippery, why it kind of disappears, why planning feels so, if not hard, at least kind of futile because, you know, the best laid plans don't really work out anyway. So um, understanding the theory, but maybe more importantly, having some good strategies to know how to manage it more effectively. Um, so my website, adultadhdbook.com, I've got information about my books and recordings and upcoming presentations and all that stuff. So that's the best place to find my stuff, although I'm sort of all over the internet. But um, let's do the Q&A. Before we start the Q&A, uh, I'd like to thank Inflow once more for sponsoring this webinar. And Ari, that was really great, interesting, great tips. So we got a ton of questions, as you might imagine. I'm um, sure. <laughs> so quite a few people said that time blindness has cost them their jobs. Yeah. So in addition, you talked about, you know, checking in more with your boss as a potential counter. But um, some people are asking what else might help them in the workplace to overcome these issues. And should they talk to their managers? Um, how should they talk to their manage, managers and disclose that they have these issues? And if yes, how might they do this? Sure. So, you know, in terms of time blindness costing jobs, yeah, I totally believe that. I absolutely do. So, you know, the sort of the general answer and then the more specific, the general answer is, um, this is about ADHD. Time is the ultimate outcome, but this is really about ADHD. So take it seriously, educate yourself about it. You know, there's lots of good tools and systems and strategies, as well as, you know, medication to help you manage ADHD much more effectively. And if it feels like your ADHD is casting too long a shadow in your life, then keep at it. And I know these days it's hard to find providers who know what they need to know, and I totally empathize with that. But just be persistent and be diligent and really, you know, kind of do the best that you can. Um, I've also got this line that regardless of what happened yesterday, make today a good day, right? So do more of those good things today, regardless of what you did yesterday. Um, I think, you know, otherwise in terms of time, be, be really intentional about it, right? Lots of, lots of clocks and reminders, reduce the distractions, um, be intentional about using a schedule and a to-do list. Don't feel like you gotta be perfect and do not be black and white about it. Um, that if you, know, if you forget your schedule for a couple of days, like don't just abandon all hope, pick it back up, use it again. Um, I think in terms of the question of disclosing, Often the advice that I give, and this is kind of its own webinar, but often the advice I give is talk symptoms before diagnoses. So don't say, I have ADHD and therefore I struggle with time. Just cut that first part off. Just say, I struggle with time. And the reason why I say that is not because there's anything wrong with having ADHD. There isn't. But you don't know what the other person knows or thinks about ADHD. If they have incorrect ideas about it, you don't do them or you any favors to tell them something. So just get to the meat of it. I struggle with time. Therefore, here are some strategies that I think will, will be really helpful. And 
my advice here is cater to self-interest, right? In other words, if it's your boss or a coworker you're talking to, you know, offer a strategy and pitch it in a way that benefits them. It's not just about what benefits you, but like if we can do these, you know, check-ins more often, you know, I'm going to do a whole lot better about nailing deadlines and making sure that I'm on the right track. So, you know, we're not going to have to go back and redo stuff as much. That is in your boss or coworker's best interest. It's much more likely that they're going to be willing to go with you on that. Um, similar, um, to that, a few people said, how can I better figure out how long it'll take me to do X, Y, or Z? Yeah, this is a really good question. So, you know, and this is part of the challenge is that, you know, how long something takes depends on a lot of factors. Um, you know, there's, there's also, it depends, what do you measure? Are you measuring only the time itself where you start and stop the clock on when you're working and then you stop it when you're off onto something else? Um, it depends how, I don't know, how long do you have to research something? Do you have to find some bits and pieces first? How often do you get interrupted? Every time you get interrupted, there's a roll of the dice as to whether, you know, you come on right back or whether you're sort of off to the races with something else. Um, you know, there's just generally this thing that, um, you know, for some, sometimes for folks with ADHD, a task will fill the time available. If you have one hour, it takes an hour. If you have three hours, it takes three hours, right? Because there isn't that pressure of the deadline until you start getting close to the end of the time. So, um, it's sort of like the analogy I use for a lot of folks with ADHD when it comes to sort of planning how long things take, it's like trying to measure something with like a warped and bent ruler, right? It's like you can't really measure it because your units are inconsistent, right? An hour doesn't feel like an hour. An hour's worth of productivity can vary a lot from one hour to the next. So, um, so maybe perhaps if you if it's a repeating thing that you do every day or often, you could time how long it takes a few times and then use that as a ballpark. If you're not really sure, better to round up and then have a bit of bonus time at the end. But I think otherwise to really do the best that you can to, you know, as I sort of said before, increase the signal or decrease the noise, right? Get rid of the distractions get rid of the off-ramps and the other stuff that's going to sort of pull you away and add time to how long it takes. And then, you know, try to just focus on that specific amount of time, at least to get a certain piece of something done. A few people asked, um, in addition to plugging into do lists into their schedules and um, a few other things you mentioned, did you, um, do you have recommendations for specific apps or tools that may be helpful to manage time and tasks that you can share? Yeah. I mean, in general, there's so many different apps and stuff out there and, you know, they all kind of have strengths and weaknesses. The general advice I give is keep it simple, find something that works well enough and then just use it. Um, because there's definitely this kind of like, like making your productivity app perfect can become its own kind of time waster, right? Its own kind of avoidance of actually doing the things that you're supposed to do. So find something good enough and then just kind of stick with it. Um, the only sort of thing I might sort of specifically mention here is, you know, folks who wind up spending way too much time on various sort of online distractions is it might be one of those things that you need to get serious about using some sort of a blocker, right? Some sort of a thing that says either blackout times of like no YouTube from nine to five or, you know, one or two hours a day, you know, so a total or something, um, or, you know, two hours a day for YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, right? So if you find that you continue to go too much to those distractions and spend too much time on it, you might need to get more serious about some sort of a blocking system just because, you know, the willpower isn't working out. Um, here's a question that I think lots of spouses can relate to. Um, my wife struggles regularly with time blindness and I have a hard time understanding and sympathizing with the way she thinks, 
what can I do or should be doing on a daily basis to help her with time and attention management? Sure. And yeah, I mean, so this is a fair question, right? Because obviously if you live with other people, even if they're roommates, but certainly if they're a spouse, right? What you do affects them also and what they do affects you. So like that is part of the package deal, right? Hopefully it's more good than bad, but sometimes it's bad. So, um, so I think the important thing here is to recognize the fact that um, your wife doesn't do this by choice, right? When she loses track of time, when she gets distracted, when she gets pulled off onto other stuff, it's not because she's being self-indulgent. It's not because she thinks her stuff is more important. It's not because she thinks you should do all the hard stuff and she does the easy stuff, right? It's that it is much harder for folks with ADHD to sort of resist the distractions and temptations. And that time just doesn't tick quite as loudly inside her mind. So I say this for a couple of reasons. The obvious one is if you can see this as it's sort of like being colorblind, right? Like it just is what it is. Then some strategies are going to be much more effective than others. And maybe there are places that you can kind of step in and be helpful, not just for her, but also helpful to get more of what you want out of the relationship, which is important if this is going to last. Um, but also there's kind of a bit of an emotional piece of like, if you recognize this is just something that she struggles with in all parts of her life, not just in terms of what affects you, maybe you don't take it as personally and then you don't feel as bad about it, right? So that enables you to be more kind of, I don't know, helpful in the problem solving side of things so that you can both get more of what you want. Okay. Um, someone asked, is there a difference in time blindness in hyperactive versus inattentive ADHD? Is it more acute in one than another? Um. I don't think so specifically. I don't know of anything that kind of separates that out, but, you know, it could certainly show up a little bit differently, you know, across different people. So, um, you know, everybody's different, you know, ADHD or not, everybody's different. Um, someone says, I've been diagnosed with severe ADHD and I don't understand why sometimes I can time things perfectly and other times I'm so far off, it's ridiculous. And actually quite a few people said that. Yeah. And that is part of the maddening inconsistency and therefore unpredictability of ADHD, right? It's sort of like folks with ADHD can do anything once, right? But then the problem is if you nail it once, people raise the bar and they're like, oh, you should be able to do it all the time. Um, so you know, it's hard not just for the person themselves, but also for kind of onlookers, so to speak, to understand what the difference is. And, you know, in general, folks with ADHD are more influenced by the sort of surroundings, right, by how sort of interested they are, how important it is, um, you know, what's happening on right now, compared to folks who don't have ADHD, have a little bit better ability to just sort of stay the course and do what needs to be done, even under less than ideal circumstances. So, um, so some of that inconsistency is just part of the package deal. Um, but, you know, to the extent that you can really try to kind of manage the stuff that you can manage in terms of the environment that you're working in. Um, and then also, and this is super easy to say, but it's much harder to do, like fill the tank, meaning get enough sleep, eat healthy enough, try to exercise, try to manage your stress. I mean, this is super easy to say, but like that's one of the ways that, you know, that also um, impacts some of that inconsistency because you're not necessarily always bringing your best. A few people asked, how old are children typically when they start to understand the concept of time? Um, you know, I don't know exactly, but it's not necessarily, I mean, it's not a sort of like either or so much as, you know, like young, young kids. So like toddlers, like their, their time horizon is very short, right? Anything more than a few minutes away, they're really not kind of thinking about it. Um, you know, as kids get older, 
their time horizon stretches out further and further. And if you think about, you know, like first and second graders, everything homework, any homework is due tomorrow. Maybe there's a project that goes a few days, but nothing goes a few weeks, really. And then it starts to stretch out middle school, high school, college, right? Like it goes further and further out as their time horizon expands out, which is great. That's how it's supposed to be, except if you're one of those kids with ADHD or whatever, where your time horizon is still a lot shorter and the expectations are beyond, they're farther out than where you tend to think. So you're going to be tending to do more stuff at the last minute compared to your classmates. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with our ADHD community. We really appreciate that. And next week, our free, type, our free webinar is titled Getting Ready to Launch, Setting Up Middle and High School Students for Success and Independence with Chris Dendy. We hope you can join us. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thank you. Thank you.